A former official at the North Korean embassy in London testified about his experience inside North Korea's central government before he defected last year. He discussed current tensions with North Korea over its nuclear program and his decision to defect to South Korea. Congressman Ed Royce chairs the House Foreign Affairs Committee. All members, if you'll have your seats. Tae Young Ho is one of the highest ranking North Korean officials ever to defect. As this former deputy ambassador to the United Kingdom will tell us, he wanted his family to be free. It is rare that we have the opportunity to hear from someone with such unique insight into the most repressive regime in the world, and one that is now threatening us with nuclear weapons. Mr. Tay, I wanted to say to you, thank you for speaking before this committee today. And I wanted also to acknowledge that it takes courage for you to do this. I met with you in August in Seoul along with Mr. Yoho of this committee and Mr. Schneider and Mr. Barra. Your observations and your recommendations to the committee today will not only help inform U.S. policy, but it is my hope that your message, including how we can peacefully denuclearize the Korean Peninsula, will reach the ears of every North Korean still suffering under Kim Jong-un's brutal rule. As I know you agree, it's crucial that we get information to North Koreans so that they can better understand the corruption of the self-serving regime there. As we will hear, elites live in relative luxury while millions barely survive. Our efforts are already putting pressure on the regime by creating and increasing defections from the country. I think the Kim regime is vulnerable. To support our information efforts, the House recently passed legislation authored by Chairman Emeritus Ross Leitinen to reauthorize the North Korean Human Rights Act. This important bill continues our broadcasts, and it updates our efforts to include more modern technology to help spread outside information into North Korea. While we should take a diplomatic approach to North Korea, the reality is that the regime itself will never be at peace with its people or, or its neighbors or us. But information is not our only tool. Congress also has done its part to ramp up economic pressure. We passed my North Korea sanctions bill last February. In July, we increased the tools at the administration's disposal by passing a big sanctions package which targets, among other, among other things, North Korean slave labor. In August, the administration secured a major victory with the unanimous adoption of UN Security Council Resolution 2371. Myself and Mr. Engel saw Ambassador Nikki Haley last night. Ambassador Haley called this the strongest sanctions ever imposed in response to a ballistic missile test. And in September, under her leadership, the Security Council passed another resolution, further upping the pressure on the regime in response to its sixth nuclear test. To be effective, these tools must be implemented aggressively. We'll hear today how sanctions are having an impact and hurting the regime there. The administration has increased the pace but we need to dramatically increase the number of North Korean-related designations, and we need to do that without delay. By using all the tools at our disposal, we can bring the necessary pressure to bear peacefully in order to denuclearize the Korean Peninsula. Mr. Tay, your insights into the impact of these efforts and life in North Korea will be invaluable. 
and I thank you for joining us here today. Uh, I have been in North Korea once. Mr. Engel has been there on two occasions, uh, and I want to thank the ranking member. What we're going to do now, Mr. Tay, is he will have his opening statement. Then we will go to you, and we will hear from you, and, uh, and afterwards we will go to the members of the committee so that they might ask you questions, and then you can respond. Mr. Engel, if you would like to uh, make your opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I stand by uh, every word you said in your opening statement. We have no disagreement on, on, on this very important issue. Mr. Tay, uh, welcome to the Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, we're deeply grateful for your time this morning. As the Chairman said, several members of the committee, myself included, have visited North Korea. I've been there twice, but not lately. We've had dozens and dozens of diplomats and experts appear before us to discuss our strategy for dealing with Pyongyang, to shed light on the abuses of the Kim regime, to provide insight on North Korea's development of nuclear weapons. You know, one of the things that was interesting when I was in Pyongyang is I got up early in the morning and walked around, and we saw a lot of people uh, going to work. And they looked, uh, they looked well fed, they looked well dressed, everything was fine. I was then told that by others that these were the elites and it, the only ones in North Korea that are uh, functioning well. And they kept us out of any place other than Pyongyang. They didn't want us to see what was going on in the rest of the country. Uh, so the insight you can provide, Mr. Tai, will, will, will give our members and the public a unique perspective on this challenge. Uh, you come to us at an urgent time. Obviously, the Kim regime has accelerated its development of nuclear weapons and ways to deliver them. Our allies, South Korea and Japan, are at risk, and the day is quickly approaching when North Korea will have the ability to hit the United States with a devastating nuclear payload. Any conflict on the Korean Peninsula, nuclear or conventional, would entail horrific loss of life. This is one of the most urgent challenges we face on the global stage, no doubt about it. And let's call it the way we see it. Administrations of both parties have failed to put a lid on the Kim regime's nuclear program over the course of decades. But I feel that what's happening now, uh, the President and the administration is undermining diplomacy in North Korea, where it's needed more than ever, hampering our ability to lead on the issue. The strategy that key cabinet officials laid out seems to call for a combination of multilateral diplomatic and economic pressure. These policies, along with shows of military force, like flying bombers in South Korean airspace, are aimed at slowing North Korea's advances. I'm not sure we've seen evidence of that, unfortunately. What we have seen is rising tensions between Washington and Pyongyang. Uh, Kim's rhetoric and the President's rhetoric has thrown fuel on the fire and I believe has escalated the risk of conflict. Let me just say, as I've said before, more than nine months into this administration, we still have no Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia and the Pacific, no Undersecretary for Arms Control and International Security, no Ambassador to South Korea, and I worry what may happen uh, later on in this month when the President travels to Asia. So there's lots and lots of work to be done, and I'm glad that this committee is staying focused on this issue. I hope we will hear from the administration again soon on its path forward. This is especially important in light of the many senior level discussions with allies and partners in Asia due to take place over the next few weeks in conjunction with the President's trip. So I'll wrap up because I want to make sure most of our time today is spent hearing from our witness. Again, we're fortunate to have you, Mr. Tai, with us today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Engel. So this morning, members, we're pleased to be joined by Mr. Tae Young Ho. He is the former Deputy Chief of Mission Embassy of the Democratic Republic's, uh, People's Republic of Korea in the United Kingdom. As a former high-ranking North Korean official, Mr. Tae can provide us, I think, some unique insights into Kim Jong-un's regime. And so, without objection, the witnesses' full prepared statements will be made part of the record. Members are going to have five calendar days to submit any statements or questions or any extraneous material for the record here today. And uh, Mr. Tay, if you would summarize your remarks, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Tay. Yes.
Chairman Royce, Ranking Member Engel, distinguished members of the House Committee, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. First, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to Chairman Royce, who kept his promise to accommodate my wishes to visit the United States and gave me this opportunity to testify before the House Committee on Foreign Affairs. As you are all aware, I worked at the front line of North Korean diplomacy until I defected to South Korea in summer of 2016. But my story is quite different from other defectors who may have experienced political oppression, inhuman treatment in political prison camps, or who left North Korea in order to avoid hunger and economic difficulties. Rather today, I would like to tell you about my life as a North Korean diplomat, why I defected to the free world, why Kim Jong-un is developing nuclear and ICBM programs, and how best to deal with the North Korean regime. I went through elite educational courses in North Korea which could not even be dreamed of by ordinary citizens there. At the age of 14, I was sent to China for a special elite educational program. More than 20 years of my past 55 years of my life were very privileged by North Korean standards. I lived and worked in foreign countries such as China, Denmark, Sweden, and the United Kingdom. The North Korean system provided me with all kinds of political privileges and economic benefits during this time, and in the course of my last posting, I was fortunate enough to live in the UK with my wife and two sons. Throughout my life, my family members and relatives were all dedicated to communists. Ironically, however, I ended up deserting that system and ideology, and I'm living in South Korea where I do not have any friends or relatives. And today, I am even testifying at the United States Congress, which I had always been taught to fight against. The reason why I gave up all the privileges and economic benefits was that I felt I could not let my sons lead a life like me as a modern day slave. I believed the best legacy I could leave for my sons was to give them the freedom that is so common to everyone in America. Had we not defected, I feared that someday my sons would have cursed me for forcing them back to North Korea. They were used to online gaming, Facebook messaging, email and internet news. I believe my sons would suffer a lot if they returned to the North Korean system. Indeed, how could any boys raised in the London education system and familiar with freedom of thought ever go back and re-acclimatize to life in North Korea? I could not confiscate, confiscate freedom and enjoyment of liberty from them. I could not take back the happy smiles of my sons by bringing them back to North Korea. I could not force my sons to pretend to be loyal to Kim Jong-un and the North Korean system and to shout, long live the Supreme Leader Kim Jong-un, long live the socialist paradise of the DPRK, like I did all my life. As a North Korean diplomat, everyday activities and services were like a leading ceaseless double life, which was psychologically difficult. I had to pretend to be loyal to the Kim Jong-un regime, even though my heart did not agree. I often was asked questions by my British friends, which caught me flat-footed trying to justify the North Korean system when deep down I knew their concerns were fair and legitimate. They asked me things such as, how could Kim Jong-un persecute his uncle? Why does North Korea continue to appeal for humanitarian aid while pouring hundreds of millions of dollars 
into its nuclear and missile development. Communism has always opposed a dynastic transfer of power. So how then does Kim family's hereditary leadership system prevail so long in North Korea? While dealing with these kinds of questions was always painful, and they made me increasingly realize the deep-rooted contradictions upon which the entire North Korean system is built. You might think that living as a member of elite class in North Korea is all about luxury goods, fine wines, and abuse of power. Yet, the reality for many privileged people in Pyongyang is far different. For example, all high-ranking leaders have to live collectively in separated apartments according to their rank. Moreover, getting promoted within this system actually requires more sacrifices, reduced freedoms, and an increasing risk of your life, even though you may enjoy more economic benefits as a result. Indeed, if it is discovered that a senior elite may have different ideas or express private dissatisfactions, then he or she could be subject to persecution. And as you all know, even the members of the Kim's family have been subject to this type of persecution. Such was the case with the killing of Kim Jong-un's uncle, Jang song Taek and half-brother Kim Jong-nam. Beyond these high-profile incidents, much more has been going on beneath the surface of the past five years. Hundreds of cadres have been persecuted without due process. For example, families of former North Korean ambassadors to Cuba and Malaysia were sent to prison camps, and nobody knows where they are now alive or dead. Former North Korean ambassador to Sweden and the former North Korean ambassador and deputy ambassador to UNESCO were also forced to return back to Pyongyang and expelled from the foreign ministry after the death of Chang song tae While on the surface, the Kim Jong-un regime seems to have consolidated its power through this reign of terror, simultaneously, there are great and unexpected changes taking place within North Korea. Contrary to the official policy and wish of the regime, the free markets are flourishing. As more and more people get used to free and capitalist-style markets, the state-owned socialist economic system becomes increasingly forgotten about. The welfare system of North Korea has long collapsed, and millions of civil servants, army officers, and security forces are dependent on bribes and state asset embezzlement for their survival. Citizens do not care about state propaganda, but increasingly watch illegally imported South Korean movies and dramas. The domestic system of control is weakening as the days go by. Back in 2010, during the Arab Spring, many experts said that it would be impossible to imagine such similar events taking place in North Korea. These changes, however, make it increasingly possible to think about civilian uprising in North Korea. As more and more people gradually become informed about the reality of their living conditions, the North Korean government will either have to change and adapt in positive ways for its citizens or to face the consequences of their escalating dissatisfaction. Until now, the North Korean system has prevailed through an effective and credible reign of terror and by almost perfectly preventing the free flow of outside information. Today, Kim Jong-un thinks that only nuclear weapons and ICBMs can help him avoid the continuing disintegration of the North Korean system. He also thinks that the existence of a prosperous and democratic South Korea so close to the border is by itself a major threat towards his dynasty. 
while Kim Jong-un has already long had the tools to destroy South Korea effectively, he also believes it is necessary to drive American forces out of the peninsula. And this can be done, he believes, by being able to credibly threaten the continental United States with nuclear weapons. On top of thousands of artillery pieces and short-range missile capabilities long held on North Korean side, the potential deployment of battle-ready nuclear ICBMs means the threat is not only towards South Korea, but also towards America. In face of this emerging situation, the U.S. government is now pursuing a policy of maximum pressure and engagement. However, it will take some time to assess the effectiveness of the current economic sanctions and campaign of diplomatic isolation. As we wait to see the outcome, we should seek to continue the momentum and even expand targeted sanctions until the North Korean regime comes back to the dialogue table for denuclearization. In face of the emerging threat, we should strengthen the U.S. and Republic of Korea alliance and enhance military preparedness in order to prevent potential nuclear and ICBM provocations by North Korea. The U.S. and Republic of Korea governments should enhance the level of their coordination and communication under the slogan of, we go together. It is a long established dialogue strategy of North Korea to exclude South Korea while communicating only with the US. The United States and South Korean governments should frustrate this North Korea strategy through strong concerted coordination. Frankly, Kim Jong-un is not fully aware of the strength and might of American military power. Because of this misunderstanding, Kim Jong-un genuinely believes that he can break the sanctions regime apart once he compels Washington to accept North Korea's new status after successfully completing the development of his ICBM program and putting the new missiles into development. Some people do not believe in soft power, but only in military options. But it is necessary to reconsider whether we have tried all non-military options before we decide that military action against North Korea is all that is left. Before any military action is taken, I think it is necessary to meet Kim Jong-un at least once to understand his thinking and try to convince him that he would be destroyed if he continues his following current direction. If we cannot, we cannot change the policy of terror of Kim Jong-un regime, but we can educate North Korean population to stand up by disseminating outside information. However, is the United States really doing enough in this regard? The U.S. is spending billions of dollars to cope with the military threat. And yet, how much does the U.S. spend each year on information activities involving North Korea in a year? Unfortunately, it may be a tiny fraction. Yet, we now know that the communist systems of the Soviet Union and East European countries crumbled as a result of dissemination of outside information and the subsequent changes in thinking caused among people within those systems. Indeed, the Berlin Wall would not have easily collapsed if East German people did not regularly watch West German TV. To sum up, much more needs to be done to increase the flows of information into North Korea. German reunification could not have been achieved if Hungarian government did not open its border with Austria to provide an exit route for the East German people. Now, some 30,000 North Korea defectors have come to South Korea. In China, however, 
tens of thousands of North Korean defectors are living without papers, under the shadows, and are being physically or sexually exploited. While the U.S. should continue urging China and Russia to support more economic sanctions, it should also do more to stop Beijing repatriating defectors back to North Korea. The world was united to abolish the South African apartheid. Now it is time for the world to stop the widespread and systematic human rights violations in North Korea, which are tantamount to the crimes committed by the Nazis. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my opening statement. Thank you again for this opportunity, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Tay. Uh, you made clear in your remarks that as more and more people gradually become informed about the reality of their living conditions in what they're told is a, you know, a paradise, but they find out how people are living in South Korea or in the rest of the world, that the, um, the North Korean government will either have to change and adapt in positive ways for its citizens or to face the consequences of the people's escalating dissatisfaction. As you said, it has been a powerful impact in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union and can have the same effect in North Korea. So my, my question is, what kind of messages should we focus on sending into North Korea? Who are the best? Is it former defectors who have a story to tell, uh, who can report the news of what they've seen in the outside world? And should our message to, uh, as, you, as you said, the elites, should our message to the elites be different than the message that we would help people send to the common people in North Korea? Um, you've made clear that, that both are increasingly dissatisfied with the regime. So what would be your suggestion? First, a North Korean system can only be in place by making its leader as a god. So we have to find out where is the Achilles Hill. Now, after five years in power, Kim Jong-un cannot still tell North Korean people his date of birth. Nobody in North Korea knows his date of birth. Nobody in North Korea knows whose mother is. Nobody no in North Korea knows his half-brother Kim Jong-nam. Nobody in North Korea knows that he is the only third son of Kim Jong-un, Kim, Kim Jong-il. And now Kim Jong-un is brainwashing the North Korean population that he is the only bloodline of back to mountain. But after five years of his, this kind of continuing brainwashing, he still cannot provide North Korean population with a single photo with his grandfather, Kim Il-sung. Why? Because he was a hidden boy by his father. He was kept secretly and silently in Switzerland throughout of his year. But majority of North Korean population do not know this fact. So we should disseminate the information about him first, who he is, why even now Kim Jong-un cannot present even a single photo with his grandfather, because his grandfather himself didn't know the existence of this boy. Majority of North Korean people do not know that his father, Kim Jong-il, had several ladies to live with. So we should tell North Korean people that Kim Jong-un and his father, Kim Jong-il, and his grandfather, Kim Il-sung, the whole member of Kim dynasty, are not the gods. That is the first thing we should do. And we should disseminate the basic concepts of freedom and human rights. North Korea is a country with 
the system of classification. The population of North Korea are divided to different classes. And we have to tell the North Korean population how stupid system it is. It is similar like a feudal class system of several hundred years ago. So we have many things to tell to North Korean people that it is not a paradise, it is not a socialist welfare system, it is a worst inhuman system in human history. In terms of uh, our dialogue with Beijing, what should we be pressing uh, Beijing on with respect to North Korea? I think uh, we should continue the current momentum to inducing Chinese government to support economic sanctions against North Korea, but that is not enough. We should urge Chinese government not to repatriate North Korean defectors back to North Korea. Chinese government knows well that once these defectors are repatriated back to North Korea, they would be the subject of torture, they would be the subject of enforcement of labor. So we should let Chinese government open the route to South Korea for all the hiding North Korean defectors in China. I mentioned a little bit about the cooperation between West German government and Hungarian government during the process of German reunification. If Chinese government help North Korean defectors to go freely to South Korea, I think that there could happen the massive exodus of North Korean population to China through their borders with China. If to uh, South Korea through China. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And if Chinese open its routes for defectors to South Korea, I think North Korean system would collapse in a very short span of time. Thank you, Mr. Tay. We go now to Mr. Elliot Engel, our ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Tay, uh, your, your comments are very uh, riveting, uh, very uh, interesting, very important, very um, important to give us uh, an insight. You know, when I was there, uh, Kim uh, Jong-il was, was the leader, and I know that he was referred to as the dear leader, and his father was referred to as the great leader, uh, Kim Il-sung. I'm wondering if uh, Kim Jong-un has a, has a similar title. You walked into every room, there were pictures of the two of them on the wall. It was something very, very scary and eerie. Is that still the case with uh, Kim Jong-un? Uh, of, of course, and Kim Jong-un even uh, further upgrading his uh, propaganda campaign to make him as a god of North Korean people. Thank you. So, so let me ask you, is there any scenario you envision in which North Korea might freeze or dismantle its long-range missile or nuclear weapons program. Um, what would be the best means to persuade North Korea to do so? I think, uh, first, Kim Jong-un uh, still believes that he can achieve this goal. So we should continue to tell the North Korean leadership, and if possible with Kim Jong-un himself, that America will not accept North Korea as a nuclear, nuclear armed state. North Korea have seen how India and Pakistan achieved that goal, and they want to follow the suit of India and Pakistan. But we should clearly clarify that this will not be the case for North Korea. Um, from what you know about the internal dynamics of the uh, North Korean political and economic systems, how might increased external pressure such as unilateral and multilateral sanctions lead the North Korean government to change course? Uh, would it? If not, why not? Oh, as I've said that uh, the current economic sanction so far uh, is not enough, so we should increase more targeted sanctions 
And the second, we have to wait and see to witness the effectiveness of the current economic sanctions. North Korea is used to that kind of sanctions, and North Korea has a certain amount of stockpiles of war. So we have to wait until when North Korea opens its doors for war stockpiles. When North Korea starts to open its war stockpiles of food and oil, then we may see how long North Korea can sustain. Thank you. You know, one of the things that shocked us when we first uh, came into Pyongyang were these massive uh, uh, billboards, uh, propaganda, political propaganda ones. And one of them has, uh, in fact, I don't know if Joe Wilson is here. He was with me, but he took a picture of um, one of those posters, and it was a North Korean soldier putting a bayonet in the head of an American uh, soldier. And we knew it was an American soldier because his helmet said USA on it. It was uh, very, very frightening, very scary, and we, we mentioned it, of course, to all the North Korean authorities. But one thing stuck in my mind. Uh, when we were talking about the nuclear program, one of the higher, we, we never did meet with the with the dear leader, but we met with, with I think, his, the next a person whose name, I think, was also Kim. Um, and we were told blankly, and it's the one thing I came home from, they said, uh, he said, uh, Saddam Hussein didn't have nuclear weapons, and look how he wound up, look where he wound up. And it really, really showed me a bit of the mindset about how they really think that the nuclear weapons are the key to being players. Otherwise, South Korea would, would run circles around them because of the prosperity and the economic opportunities and the dy dynamism of the Seoul regime. But they, even back then, this was probably about 12 years ago, talked about nuclear weapons as their, as their key to success in the future. Is that still the mindset? Yes, still. Kim Jong-un regime uh, believes that they can uh, guarantee the permanent the system of North Korea by nuclear and ICBM, because they think that prosperous and democratic South Korea itself is uh, threatening the existence of North Korea itself. That's why they think and believe that ICBM tipped with nuclear weapons is the guarantee for their survival. Let me ask you one brief question. Uh, my final question is, have you observed any changes in North Korea in recent years that might suggest that an expanded United States information campaign targeting audiences inside North Korea might be more successful than past efforts? Uh, how would you go about changing the North Korea's perception of the outside world? When the uh, South Korean cultural contents first arrived North Korea through a smuggling, North Korean authorities tried every measures to prevent it, even by conducting public executions and rampant arrest of the people who watch South Korean movies and dramas. But whatever measures they take, the demand for South Korean cultures increased. So North Korean regime learned that that kind of enforcement cannot solve the problem. That's why for the past few years, they are now developing their own strategy to prevent North Korean population to watch South Korean movies and dramas. How? They decided to open the archives of Kim Jong film archives of Kim Jong Il, and decided to filter the for those foreign films from former Soviet Union and former socialist Eastern European countries to find out the films which can meet the demand of enjoyment for North Korean people. So now, if you are in 
Pyongyang streets, there are a lot of stores where they sell those DVD discs with hundreds of Russian films, former East German films, Chinese films, and even these days, American cartoons like Tom and Jerry, Lion King, or uh, Beauty and Beast of these even cartoons for the children. So they learned that in order to feel the demand for cultural, outside cultural contents, they should do something. So that's why this proved that North Korean regime are very afraid of dissemination of information. So I think if we continue to disseminate and if we continue to make a tailor-made content for North Korea, then I think we can make a change in North Korea. Up, up until now, those cultural contents of South Korea, which North Korean people are watching, are the contents which are produced for South Korean audience, not for North Koreans. So they just watch it for their amusement and entertainment. But those cultural contents so far do not actually relate the North Korean citizens' way of thinking. Those cultural contents cannot make North Koreans critically analyze the life of North Korea. That's why we should make a tailor-made content which can educate North Korean population. And I think it's time we should invest to make that kind of very simple tailor-made concepts which can tell the basic concepts of freedom, human rights, and democracy. Thank you very much. We go to Mr. Chris Smith of New Jersey. Thank you so very much. And <clears throat> Mr. Tay, thank you for your courage and for being here, uh, providing your insights and observations. Um, I remember the, the, during the worst days of the Cold War, when it used to be said that the Iron Curtain isn't soundproof, and your idea of, of really ratcheting up the freedom broadcasting couldn't come at a more timely uh, point in, in this terrible escalating conflict. So thank you for that, and that has to be followed up on. Let me ask you two things uh, first. You've made a stunning observation and recommendation that if China were to receive defectors and facilitate their passage into South Korea, that that could truly debilitate this dictatorship and lead to its demise. My question, uh, China, and I've held several hearings on this, uh, China violates the refugee convention uh, with impunity. Uh, the whole idea of rapprochement, uh, they send people back who then go to the gulags, or they benefit by trafficking those people who come in, particularly the women, uh, into sex trafficking and labor trafficking. Uh, so they're making money out of it, and they're also violating the refugee convention. My hope is that your words to the Chinese governments, as well as our own governments, uh, uh, will, will act upon that, because that is a very benign and, and certainly uh, a way of trying to de-escalate and lead to an end to this, this escalating crisis. So thank you for that. You might want to speak to that further. Secondly, on we underestimate, I think, uh, the whole idea of Juche and the cult of personality. You know, Emperor Hirohito uh, and the fanaticism of Imperial Japan was based on the belief that this was godlike, that he was God, and as you have said, God. That's exactly how they look at the Kims, particularly Kim Il Sun. And I think there's a gross underappreciation of how that leads to fanaticism and the willingness to die uh, for now the new Kim uh, because. It's God. He's God. And I wonder if you could shed some insights into whether or not the people still believe that and to what degree, particularly in the Army. We know they have a million people active, about five or so ready reserve. Uh, I mean, that is a potent force coupled with nuclear uh, where they're willing to die uh, for God. First of all, about the defectors case in China. If you visit the of Chinese border with North Korea, you can easily learn that a Chinese government has uh, built up the extensive network of catching the North Korean defectors along its borders. And if North Korean uh, defector is caught, then he or she could immediately be repatriated. As, and if we visit those borders these days, Chinese have built more fences 
more river banks in order to prevent uh, the vast uh, exodus of uh, North Korean population. Now, Chinese government are saying that they are very much concerned of any possible uh, refugee crisis if North Korean system collapse. But that is not uh, uh, really the truth because North Korean defectors and North Korean population, they have a place to go if once they arrive in China. They have a South Korea which would welcome to accommodate all North Korean defectors from China. So the Chinese argument that they would cover or they would burden all the economic, the, uh, the cost of North Korean refugees is not true because there is a government of South Korea which can accommodate all those North Korean defectors. So we should continue to ask Chinese government to open the exit route for North Korean defectors to go to South Korea. We'll ask, we should ask Chinese government to let establish a kind of camps for North Korean defectors for temporary stay and for continuation of their journey to North, South Korea. I think that is the thing we should do. And China is the member of refugee convention. That's why as a big country, Chinese government has obligation to observe its international obligation by letting North Korean defectors to go to China. And the, the second thing, the idea, the, you know, personal cult or uh, culture in North Korea. It is really, really surprising because in North Korea, you, when you reach the age of four or five, from the age of kindergartens, you are brainwashed. For instance, every morning, the young children of three or four years are forced to bow in front of the portraits of Kim Jong-il, Kim Il-sung, and Kim Jong-un. Whenever they are offered a cup of milk, they should stand up and express their thanks before they drink the milk uh, to uh, the Kim Jong-un. When there is a harvest of apples, the apples will be distributed to the population as a gift of Kim Jong-un. So, those Kim Jong-un regime established a full scale of a stupid brainwashing system in order to depicting the Kim Jong-un as the god. So I think we should try our concentrate efforts to educate North Korean people that Kim Jong-un is not a god. He is just a normal human being. And Kim family is not the family of the god. And we should continue to tell North Korean people we should touch the Achilles heel of Kim Jong-un regime. That is my viewpoint. Thank you. Thank you. Albio Series of New Jersey is next in the queue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, I'm, I'm fascinated by, by your comments. Uh, what? I'm not really surprised because I've seen the indoctrination process in other countries and how it works. But I'm concerned with the, the nuclear program. It seems that they have developed this nuclear program very rapidly. Can you uh, talk a little bit about who's assisting them? Because it seems that it's so rapid that somebody had a system. Is it China? Is it uh, Iran? Is it uh, Russia? In your opinion, <clears throat> is anybody involved in assisting with their nuclear uh, proliferation? Oh, uh, it is uh, uh, the common knowledge that uh, North Korea's uh, basic uh, the knowledge of nuclear weapons are all came from the former Soviet Union. In late of 1960s and the 70s, it was the policy of a former Soviet Union to control all the nuclear experts and nuclear industries of former socialist countries by inviting and educating all those nuclear experts in Russia. So 
North Korea started to send its young nuclear experts to Russian's nuclear institute from late of 1950s. So actually, North Korea accumulated the vast knowledge of making these nuclear weapons from Russia. But of course, at that time, the Soviet Union government did not intend to tell North Korean nuclear experts how to make nuclear weapons, but they educated to the North Korean nuclear experts in order to expand their nuclear power industry and in order to control the whole socialist world of nuclear energy. But North Korean regime took the advantage of this education system built in 50s and 60s, and they accumulate huge and all those knowledges how to make it. But in the past five years, we witnessed that there is all of a sudden a kind of quick acceleration of this process of ICBM and nuclear development. So how was it possible? We learned that in March of 2013, Kim Jong-un regime, the Workers' Party of Korea, adopted a policy of simultaneously developing nuclear weapons and economy, which is called Byungjin policy. Then what is the difference between Kim Jong-un's policy of nuclear development with his father and with his grandfather? In throughout the history of North Korea, Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il never stopped the developing nuclear program. But the main difference between Kim Jong-un and Kim Jong-il is that Kim Jong-un wants to achieve that goal in a very short span of time and in a very open way. During the Kim Jong-il's period, North Korean regime developed nuclear program under the pretext of denuclearizing Korean Peninsula. So in other words, when Chinese, you know, uh, wants to force North Korea to stop it, they always justify it to Chinese government that, hey, Chinese brother, we need this nuclear weapon in order to lend the ears of Americans. So our final goal is not the acquisition of nuclear weapons, but to reach a kind of deal with Americans. So they cheated Chinese again and again and again. But these days, no, the tune the justification is different. North Korea openly say to China that we want to achieve this goal openly at any cost. And secondly, from the March of 2013, North Korean regime decided to invest all available materials and finance for the completion of nuclear weapons. So that is the main difference between present North Korean regime and the previous Kim Jong-un's period. Thank you. We go now to Congressman Dana Rohrbacher of California. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you very much to our witness today. I appreciate the insights that you are providing us. Um, a couple of things that you've mentioned I'd like to get some clarification on. Uh, do the people of North Korea know that Kim Jong-un, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, uh, was educated in Switzerland and at a private, elite private school? Do they know that? Majority of North Korean population didn't know that he was educated in Switzerland, no. Um, don't we have broadcasts going into North Korea? Why, is, why would the people of North Korea not know that what he is doing to them, he was spared, and that he, is a, uh, he lived in a totally different life than, than what they are expected to live. Uh, are broadcast uh, uh, not being aggressive enough if the people of North Korea don't know that? Oh, uh, maybe uh, uh, the, those, you know, the balloons of the pamphlets or uh, the numbers of the radios uh, uh, have reached the inside of North Korea in a secret ways, but uh, so far uh, the effect of that kind of the devices is not uh, uh, very efficient. So I think uh, in order to uh, 
vastly disseminating the information to North Korean people, I think we should develop a new ways to do it. Uh, for instance, one thing I have in mind is that now uh, we can uh, have a kind of the satellite uh, TV transmissions for North Korean people, and we can uh, smuggle in the small devices like uh, DMB things, which is the similar size of smartphone or radio, so let the North Koreans watch the South Korean and American uh, uh, the TV network through that kind of Davis by the transmission from satellite. Um, that sounds like a, uh, uh, frankly, that sounds like an effective uh, use of money as compared to uh, some of the other things that we're doing to try to deal with this threat. Because if we do not deal with this threat, uh, we're, we are putting uh, uh, not only the people of South Korea, but putting the American people. In, uh, in severe jeopardy here, in danger. Let me ask you, you mentioned, um, how is religion treated in North Korea? Oh, North Korea uh, system uh, uh, it's, is based on contradictions. For instance, the North Korean constitution uh, allows the freedom of belief. But the, in North Korea is a society where the constitution does not prevail the charter of Workers' Party of Korea and the teachings by Kim Jong-un prevails over the constitution. So if we read the charter of Workers' Party of Korea and the teachings of Kim Jong-un and the works of Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il, it clarified very clearly that Chuchi ideology and Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-ilism should be the only idea of North Korea society. Do they permit people to go to church? There are a few churches only in Pyongyang just for show for foreign audiences, not for North Korean people. Do the North Korean people have, as I have understood has happened in China in the beginning, uh, worship services in their homes? Uh, do they get together and pray? and? Uh, is there a religious movement in uh, South Korea? It has a tremendous uh, expansion of, uh, of faith. And uh, uh, is that anywhere in, experienced in North Korea? If uh, that kind of practice is, is dictated by the regime, then it could be the uh, imminent subject of persecution or public execution. That's why I don't think that uh, the people would gather for that kind of uh, the religious practice, but I'm not quite sure uh, whether there are individuals who do that kind of belief practices in secretly inside uh, their homes. But in my life, uh, I have seen uh, that kind of secret practice of religious uh, belief. Well, we need to be the uh, champion of these oppressed people around the world, especially when it comes to Christians who are oppressed like this, because our own national security will be enhanced by that. So doing what's right by religious people who are being persecuted for their religion can probably uh, help us. And thank you very much for sharing your insights with us today. Thank you. R Representative Bill Keating of Massachusetts. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and Mr. Tenney, thank you very much for your desire and courage to be here. Uh, just this morning, I was at a breakfast of experts uh, discussing uh, North Korea's threat to us, as well as uh, their rationale for many of their activities. They suggested that uh, their ICBM and their nuclear uh, development uh, was to preserve uh, the regime from international threats, but also, they said, uh, it's there for domestic support as well. And you had said, there's an escalating dissatisfaction among the people. So could you explain their rationale in saying, is there a group that sees uh, you know, support of the regime because of that nuclear development? I, I, I do not un understand your last question. What, what was it? That uh, Kim Jong-un uh, is developing uh, nuclear weapons and ICBMs to, to gather support and stability in his regime in his country, within it. Uh, you said that uh, it's, 
de-escalating his support. So uh, what is the rationale? Is, are there people that see that development as stabilizing and give the regime support as a result? Mm. Yes. The, the first, uh, Kim Jong-un is uh, very well aware that North Korean system is uh, on the process of uh, disintegration. That's why he uh, looked for any solution to do it, and he believes that uh, ICBM tipped with nuclear weapons can uh, provide him a kind of legitimacy of the leadership for next several decades. So, Why? Yes. The people inside feel that uh, this will help them from an outside threat as they perceive it. Is that correct? Uh, both ways. Uh, Kim Jong-un uh, thinks that with that uh, the nuclear weapons, he can get uh, the the uh, guarantee his uh, the sustainability of his rule, and on second thing that in order to get uh, the legitimacy of long-term leadership, uh, something like he wants to convince the whole North Korean elite and the people that he is the one who made make North Korea, who made North Korea as a nuclear st status, and he wants to convince the North Korean population that once he acquired these nuclear weapons, he can easily break the sanction scheme. Okay, thank you very much. With America. That's the rationale. This is a really tough question I'm going to ask you. Uh, one we should all be asking, frankly, because there's a great deal of discussion, uh, even this morning, that there's uh, indeed a likelihood of military intervention preemptively uh, by the U.S. as a defense. A and here's my question. What's going to happen after, if that happens? What's going to happen when the missiles stop? What's the next day going to be like? Who's going to be in charge? How are we going to keep stability? What is uh, China going to do? Uh, what are we going to do with the human impact of that, uh, as well as the, uh, do you think, as someone that's been in Europe, that our partners will be on board? What are, what are your thinkings on this very important issue? After Kim Jong-un uh, finishes uh, his completion of nuclear weapons, then uh, he wants to open a dialogue and deal with America. He would continue to blackmail America with a possible uh, nuclear war with America and may ask America to pull American forces from South right. Korea. I'm, I apologize, but what would happen, here's a scenario but that if, if we did if I, could, if I could interview, yeah. just interrupt for a minute. He has a follow-up point that he wants to make about what, w I think, about what would happen next to South Korea if that happens. Then, then we'll continue with your question. Oh, if I could yeah. give him time to answer that. Thank you. Mm. Yes, so what he think, what his roadmap and strategy is like this. Once he have this nuclear weapon and ICBM, and he wants to make a deal with Americans uh, uh, by asking scale down joint military exercise against North Korea and finally pull American forces out uh, from Korean Peninsula. If America does not accept his offer in a first hand, then he may continue to blackmail like another test fire or ISBM or something like that so that it compel Washington to accept his demands. And Kim Jong-un thinks that if American forces is out of, of from Korean Peninsula, the next day, the foreign investment would follow the American forces. And when the foreign investments are out of South Korea, then the elite and the companies of South Korea would follow the exit. So he thinks that he can create a kind of massive flea in South Korean system if he has these nuclear weapons. That is what North Korean regime from the case of South Vietnam. When America pulled its troops out from South Vietnam in 1974, at that time I think we should remember that the army of South Vietnam was number four in military terms. But when America pulled its forces from South Vietnam, Later, the foreign investments left. When foreign investments left South Vietnam, then the elite of a South Vietnam ruling class started to flee. So within two years, within two years in South Vietnam, there was a kind of huge trend of fleeing. So 
North Vietnam waited for two years and they started offensive in 1976. And all of a sudden, the huge military establishment of South Vietnam was useless to defend its system. So North Korean regime learned all these process. That's why they want to follow the same suit on South Korea. That's why with that ICBM, they want to change the current tide of the struggle between North Korea and South Korea. Wow. No, thank you. I yield back. Uh, Mr. Mike McCall of Texas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think this is one of the most uh, complex, challenging foreign policy uh, issues of our time. And uh, I th whenever a power becomes a nuclear power, you can't take it away from them. And we saw that happen in Pakistan and the AQCon network proliferating to Iran, North Korea. I think we, um, this is the result of a policy of neglect in prior administrations, both Republican and Democrat, not dealing with North Korea. And now we are in a situation where we are today where I don't see a whole lot of good options on the table. Uh, it is a fact that he has this ICBM capability, that he's miniaturized uh, the nuclear warheads. By all accounts, the IC, uh, while may, maybe not uh, uh, definitive, we think he may have that capability now as well. And j talked to the ambassador from Japan the other day, and they are terrified of, of, of what the prospects. I, I, I don't know how to get rid of this guy. And we talk about regime change. We talk about opening channels, letting people defect, and and, and a lot of different things. We know China is the strongest country to deal with North Korea, and it's in their best interest in their backyard. And yet we're seeing satellite technology, uh, satellite uh, photographs after the UN sanctions was voted on, um, defying those sanctions with boats going back and forth between China and North Korea. So that hasn't had a whole lot of impact. So I, you know, and I, and I, I you're, it's been very interesting. I mean, you're, and let me commend you for your courage coming here today uh, in light of, of the dangers and the obvious risks that you're taking. I think you're a courageous individual, um, but they're almost deified, this dynasty. So I, I don't, I just, how, how do we, how do we change that? First question. Second one is, if the military option is on the table and Secretary Mattis has warned against it, but if that happened, what would the peninsula look like? What would be the aftermath of the military option? The first, uh, uh, I think uh, many people do not understand why North Korean regime uh, believe uh, that uh, uh, nuclear weapons can uh, solve their problems and uh, why Kim Jong-un's regime is so much obsessed with this kind of nuclear weapons program, which can do nothing but all those, you know, sanctions or whatever. But from the perspective of uh, North Korean regime and Kim Jong-un regime, they are really, uh, so far, they really uh, believe in uh, that uh, this kind of goal can be achieved. Uh, so, for instance, now uh, uh, let's review about a uh, U.S. and ROK military alliance. Uh, let's compare the the military alliance between South Korea and America, and military alliance between China and North Korea. North Korean regime uh, learned that there are a lot of loopholes in military alliance between South Korea and our, uh, the America. For instance, in that military alliance treaty, there is no any clause of compulsory involvement in military alliance with South Korea. So if a state of war or any kind of war happens on Korean Peninsula, both sides would discuss. That is the clause. There is no any legal binding. But if you read North Korean military alliance with China, there is a compulsory clause. If war happens on Korean Peninsula, then Chinese side will aut automatically, naturally 
involved in this war. And secondly, if we see the military alliance treaty between South Korea and America, there is a, a kind of a very loose clause how this treaty go on and how this treaty uh, breaks down. If one party of this treaty say goodbye one year in advance, then this military alliance would disappear. That is the present reality. But if we read the North Korean military alliance with China, it's a kind of divorce agreement. If one of the parties do not agree to break this treaty, then this treaty would last again and again and again. So I think we have to cover up all those loopholes in military alliance between ROK and America. That's why North Koreans still believe that if they have these nuclear weapons and continue to blackmail, and it can make the strategists in Washington to think whether America is ready to sacrifice at least with one of their cities in America in return for protecting the whole South Korean territory. And they strongly believe to do that because they learned from the history about the lessons of Atchison Line. In January of 1950, then U.S. The Secretary of State Atchison draw that Atchison line, actually that is the line of defense between South Korea and Japan. So at that time, America did not include South Korea as their own sphere of protection. That prompted the decision of Korean War by Stalin and Kim Il-sung. Why? Because Soviet Union succeeded in nuclear test in August of 1949. And after this success of nuclear test by Soviet Union, the strategist in Washington thought that how to prevent any kind of accidental nuclear war with Soviet Union. So they decided to draw a lead line of defense and unfortunately, they draw that red line not on 38th parallel, but the place on the sea between South Korea and Japan. So from these precedents of Vietnam case, mm -hmm. Korean War case, even Chinese case, because Chinese Communist Party also succeeded in driving American forces out from Taiwan in 1979 by completing its ICBM program. So from these precedents and history, North Korean communists learned that once they acquired this technology and means to attack America, and they, if they continue to blackmail until America and Washington accepts their deal, they can prevail on this game. That is their, their strong belief. And the second thing about the question about military, the option, of course, I strongly believe that if there is any preventive or surgical strike or whatever, I think the war will be won by American and South Korea. There is no doubt about it. But we have to see the human sacrifice from this military option. Now, there are tens of thousands of North Korean artilleries and short-range missiles are ready to fire at any moment along the military demarcation line. And North Korean officers are trained to press the button without any further instructions from the general command if something happens on their side. So if there is any sound of fire or bomb or strike from Americans, the military artilleries and short-range missiles will fire against South Korea. And we have to remember that tens of millions of South Korean populations are living 70 to 80 kilometers away from this military demarcation line. Very short distance of range of fire. And it will, nobody can calculate, but I think certain human sacrifice would happen because of this uh, military option. So as I've said, there are tremendous changes are taking place inside North Korea in spite of this reign of terror. 
by Kim Jong-un regime if we are determined to use and expand our soft power, I think one day we can reach the same goal we achieved with former Soviet Union and those former East European Socialist countries. Very insightful. Rep Thank you. Representative uh, Tulsi Gabbard of Hawaii. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for your courage and your openness in being here to share your story and experience not only with us but with everyone uh, who's watching this. Um, to follow up on, on your last statement, so what you're saying is that if there is even a very limited preemptive military strike from the United States, that this automatic response using the artillery and short-range missiles would occur, is that right? Yes, that's right. You spoke earlier in your testimony about um, exhausting all diplomatic measures before turning towards military action. And you mentioned about the need to meet with Kim Jong-un yes, directly. Yes, that's right. What would need to happen in that conversation to create even just the beginnings of a process that would result ultimately in dismantling and denuclearization of the peninsula? And how would that be different from uh, previous failed efforts in the past? Oh, I think first of all we should tell Kim Jong-un that North Korean nuclear case is quite different from India, Pakistan or Chinese because India and Pakistan achieved their goal without making any enemies with the big powers like America, China or the Russia. So that's why in reality there was no any big country who was so serious to stop the nuclear arming in India or Pakistan. But a North Korea case is different because North Korea wants to achieve that goal by blackmailing, by threatening America's interest in America continent. So that is the great difference though. So we should tell Kim Jong-un that his goal to achieve the nuclear status cannot be achievable because as long as an America will not accept North Korea as a nuclear state forever, we have to tell him correctly. And we should tell Kim Jong-un that America is ready to use all military options if Kim Jong-un continues this process. And we should tell Kim Jong-un that if Kim Jong-un stops this process and gives up his ambition of ICBN and nuclear development, America is ready to help Kim Jong-un to build its economy and to make North Korea a prosperous country. I think that is the point we should directly deliver to Kim Jong-un. You know, it's been spoken about how one of the major reasons why Kim Jong-un is holding and, and, and tightening his grip on these nuclear weapons is as a deterrent against uh, any attempts by the United States or others to topple him and his regime, thinking that this will be the only thing that will protect him. Why is it that if the United States sits down directly with Kim Jong-un that you think he will react positively to a message of, we'll help you uh, make sure that your people and your economy prosper? That, that doesn't appear to seem something that, that he's been concerned about in the past. Mm. Oh, as I've said, that uh, the Kim Jong-un uh, and North Korean regime believes that their uh, rivalry South Korea is uh, the biggest uh, the threat to North Korean system itself because Kim Jong-un is very well aware that North Korean population, uh, every day they are watching South Korean movies and dramas. They, he knows that the mind of North Korea are changing towards South Korea, so uh, uh, he needs a kind of a permanent guarantee uh, to uh, protect his dynasty from uh, that kind of uh, the game. And uh, he strongly believes that uh, nuclear weapons can use a, uh, as a kind of very strong defense proof, a roof of uh, his dynasty. So I think uh, we should tell Kim Jong-un that that cannot be the effect way to uh, for his sustainability of his leadership and rule in North Korea. And you, you've talked about this changing, a little bit of a change in the currents and the feeling of the North Korean people. Given the 
uh, threats upon anyone who expresses even a little bit of dissent or disagreement. Do you think Kim Jong-un or his regime is even aware of this change in currents of the North Korean people? Yes, he is very well aware of that because uh, he has a very good network of reporting the happenings inside uh, North Korea. And so far, Kim Jong-un regime uh, has taken huge measures to prevent North Korean population uh, watching South Korean movies and dramas, but it turned out to be a failure. And also, uh, throughout the system of free market, North Korean regime tried to prevent the escalation of a free market system in North Korea, but failed. So now, North Korea is at the stage of more or less accepting this trend of free marketization of the process in North Korea. So they know quite well of this disintegrating process. We need to go to uh, General Scott Perry of Pennsylvania. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Tay, we're impressed uh, by your courage, and we're privileged to have you here today. Um, what would the effect be? Would there be any effect at all on North Korea being named a state sponsor of terror once again? Would that have any effect whatsoever uh, to the regime or their actions? I think that he, uh, that can be very helpful because once North Korea is re registered as the sponsor state of terrorism, it can be more easily to drive North Korea from all international financial systems, and we can also uh, uh, convince uh, the other partners of the world to uh, detect or stop all those uh, the channels North Korea. Uh, uses these days to fund their nuclear development. It seems to me that a big part of our strategy should be and is the relationship with China and North, and North Korea, but it also seems to me that China isn't forthcoming uh, with their agreements. They water down the agreements. They don't follow the agreements that, that they have. Is China really the linchpin that we think it is? Is it the center of gravity? Can they make the difference if they stop? Where China is not, 90 percent of North Korea's trade is with China. Um, you know, coal alone, a billion dollars annually. If China would live up to its agreements, can it have the effect that we hope it would with North Korea? Can it bring Kim Jong-un, not the people, unfortunately, but can it bring the regime to its knees? Oh, first of all, uh, I would like to avail this opportunity to tell that uh, during the uh, Trump, administra Trump administration short span of time, America has made uh, great success in convincing Chinese uh, to take more uh, sanctions against uh, North Korea. But on the meanwhile, we should continue to ask uh, Chinese to uh, stop and crack down all those smuggling network between North Korea and China. Because if the Chinese government officially the limit the trade with North Korea, it can easily uh, produce another negative effects by more smugglings between uh, China and North Korea. Because along the borderline of, between China and North Korea, there are hundreds of private traders, small companies who are smuggling and who are involved in dealing these uh, uh, illicit uh, the activities with North Korea. And so far, Chinese government has been reluctant to crack down all these other uh, smuggling uh, network between China and North Korea. So I think it's time we should raise the issue of this smuggle with the Chinese government. And if Chinese government further upgrade its the level of sanctions, I think it will create a big pain on Kim Jong-un regime. Could that Chinese smuggling be used to our advantage regarding the information flow into North Korea? I wonder about the, the there's one thing to get the information there, whether you broadcast, whether you somehow smuggle it in, DVDs, thumb drives, what have you. But I also wonder about the other side of that equation, the North Korean people's ability to access it. Is that a possibility since you mentioned it? 
Uh, it has two aspects. For instance, I think if uh, the, the possibility of uh, smuggling uh, is expanded, uh, there can be uh, more opportunity of uh, smuggling these Davises in to North Korea. But on the other hand, uh, if the smuggling opportunity is expanded, I think North Korean regime it was, it will be able to uh, import what they wanted. But the, the materials which North Korea regime wants to import is big things like oil of those uh, special, the metals of or engines for their military and equip. But the things we want to disseminate is a very small things. For instance, be, uh, due to the recent development of IT allergy, the Davis technology, the deficits of these uh, for dissemination is getting smaller and smaller. For instance, five years ago, five years ago, if we want to disseminate the contents, we should uh, make a, this size of DVD and this size of USB stick. But nowadays, those cultural devices now become smaller around this size of a small SD card. So in North Korea, young children call this SD card nose card, because why they call it nose card? If their bodies are searched, they can easily put that card inside their nose to avoid searching. Mr. Tay, may I ask you one question, one more question in the short amount of time I have left. Since I've been a little boy, I've heard about American prisoners from Vietnam and the Second World War being held in POW camps in North Korea. Was there, is there any truth of that to, you, to your knowledge? Would you have any knowledge of that? Was it ever discussed? What do you know about that, if anything? Oh, to be honest, I have no idea about it. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. We, we go okay. now uh, to Representative Norma Torres from California. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Tate, thank you for uh, joining us today. I am trying to um, comprehend um, what caused you and the wave of defectors um, to leave the, during the time that you left um, versus under the previous um, supreme leader. Can you talk a little bit about that? You mean my case? Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to tell uh, the members here that I am not the only uh, North Korean uh, diplomat who defected in... There was a wave, yeah, right. The, the, mm. There are more uh, the North Korean defectors who, uh, I mean, diplomats who defected, but it, this is the matter of whether uh, they are willing to open their identity or not. But, you know, as I have told you, that I was fortunate to uh, bring my wife and two sons uh, here in we South We have very Korea. limited time, sir. Yeah, yeah. I apologize. That's right. So, um, but uh, the other, my colleagues who are also diplomats, they uh, have their, you know, the siblings. Why and, now and not before, sir? Yeah, so uh, actually the number of the uh, diplomatic defection is uh, more than uh, we uh, estimate. More now or more under the previous? Under the previous, uh, yeah, I mean in the past two or three years. Two or three years under? Um, Kim Jong-un regime. Right. Yes. Why now under this regime and not the previous? What is the, what, what's the difference? What caused you to say enough is enough? Because the first uh, Kim Jong-un uh, escalated his reign of terror the, the, of this kind of thing. So uh, many diplomats and elite group lost confidence uh, on the system. And uh, also now Kim Jong-un is desperately accelerating this nuclear process, which is very, very even danger to the existence of North Korea. Was there something specific um, to you personally that caused you to say, this is it, it's time for me to leave? Oh, there is uh, not that kind of, you know, triggering point, but as I have said that I have watched and followed the, those uh, growing process of my sons in London, and I thought that it is not the right thing for me mm -hmm. to take them back. Um, Mr. Uh, Kim Jong-un is a young man. He's going to have a birthday on January 8th. That's right. 
but so nobody knows which year. Who between Russia and China, where, who do you think um, is more involved in advising him on issues dealing with the U.S.? I don't think uh, China or Russia is advising Kim Jong-un on that matter. He is advised by uh, his close associates. Yet <clears throat> China is very dependent on workers and um, from North Korea. Yes. So how can it be that China is not advising him on how to deal with the U.S.? Oh, I mean, when advice is that uh, I don't think that uh, the uh, Chinese has any kind of, you know, the uh, diplomatic uh, instrument which can change the thought of Kim Jong-un. And also it is a common fact that uh, China uh, is uh, exercising the double standard, uh, the approach on North Korea on one hand, He's, the China is keeping its obligation with United Nations sanctions, but on the other hand, it is also opening the possibilities for North Korea to fund its program by uh, uh, importing a lot of North Korean laborers to their countries. Smuggling networks, um, private traders, small companies. Um, do you have um, an idea of you know who they are and how we can, as a U.S. Um, policy impact um, that activity? I think that is the matter of the Chinese decision. I think we should continue to convince Chinese government that North Korean nuclear threat is not only the threat to America, but it, it, it can be the threat to China itself. So I think we should continue to convince the Chinese government to cooperate to stop North Korea's nuclearization. And if Chinese is convinced, then I think Chinese government will take effective measures to stop and crack down all the smuggling network. So what I'm understanding... Okay, well, the um, time's expired, though. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we've got to go to Joe Wilson of South, uh, South Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ambassador Tay. I appreciate your courage on behalf of the Korean people. Uh, I represent many constituents in South Carolina who have served in Korea. They developed a great affection for Korean families. Uh, I can identify because my dad served in the Flying Tigers during World War II, and he developed a great affection for the people of India and China. Additionally, I want you to know that the Korean-American population is so important across the United States, but in my home state of South Carolina, this weekend we have the Korean Festival, and uh, it's to celebrate the extraordinary culture of Korea. Uh, and at uh, Columbia, South Carolina, the Korean Presbyterian Church, uh, led by Reverend Dong Young Kim, um, there will be a great celebration of uh, how much uh, the people of America appreciate the culture of Korea. And, and Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your leadership promoting freedom for the Korean citizens, which is of the utmost importance for the people of South Korea and American families for our security. It's for this reason I'd like to thank uh, the Chairman uh, for his attention to a bill that's been uh, proposed by Congressman Adam Schiff of California. It's a bipartisan bill that supports and clarifies and complements the State Department's recent prohibition on the tourist travel to North Korea, sadly reflecting on the murder of Otto Warmbier. Mr. Tay, would you agree that sadly North Korea is a supremely dangerous place? And I applaud the State Department with the leadership of President Donald Trump and UN Ambassador Nikki Haley for their efforts through the expeditious passage of H.R. 2397, the North Korea Travel Control Act. The danger that North Korea poses to America and our allies is a bipartisan concern, and I'm just so grateful that both uh, Chairman Ed Royce and Ranking Member Elliot Engel have, have supported its passage out of the Subcommittee on Asia and the Pacific. And Ambassador Tay, I have recently visited uh, the beautiful country of South Korea. What an extraordinary country. And I know of the critical relationship that we have that, quote, we go together. Additionally, I'm grateful that with uh, Chairman Royce and Congressman Ed uh, Elliott Engel, um, we're possibly the only members of Congress who have been to North Korea. Uh, we saw uh, the destitution, oppression uh, of the people in, in Pyongyang. Uh, and, uh, but that's in contrast to the extraordinary success of the people of South Korea, the Republic of Korea, and in Seoul. With that in mind, 
there have been measures passed both in Congress and at the UN, uh, led by Ambassador Nikki Haley, the former governor of my home state, South Carolina, that target North Korean textiles, coal, iron ore, seafood, and other sectors that are used to finance the illicit programs of the North Korean regime. Are there any other sectors or streams of revenue that we could act? Uh, I'm also grateful that President Donald Trump has begun a process of what's called secondary sanctions. Are, are, can you suggest to the President uh, any secondary sanctions uh, that should be uh, enforced to help the people of Korea? Oh, I think uh, oh, there are uh, some uh, targeted uh, the sanction uh, measures taken by, by uh, something like secondary boycott. I strongly believe that this kind of secondary boycott measures should be uh, expanded to target the Chinese and Russian uh, the companies who helps the illicit activity by North Korea. But on the meanwhile, I also uh, uh, want to use uh, diplomatic uh, the soft power, something like the campaign to isolate North Korea and in diplomatic world. Ironically, so far, only few countries in the world expelled North Korean ambassadors as a protest of the current uh, continuation of nuclear program. For, for instance, now North Co the, uh, Korea has conducted the sixth nuclear test, but except Spain, no European countries so far have ever expelled or downgraded the current diplomatic relations with North Korea. What happened between Iran and European countries in the past because of the case of Rashid, the, the Iranian novelist at that time, the whole European Union together with America, joined in their efforts to isolate Iran uh, diplomatically by withdrawing all the ambassadors from Tehran and asking Iran to, uh, to uh, withdraw their ambassadors from all European capitals. But so far, we haven't seen that kind of concerted or unified response from Western European countries, which we share common ideas and values. So that's why I think the American government should beef up more its campaign of diplomatic isolation against North Korea, asking the American allies to follow the suit, to follow the America's policy to isolate North Korea diplomatically. Now in North Korean workers, tens of thousands of North Korean workers are working in American Middle East allies like Kuwait, uh, the Arab Emirates, but these Arab countries are still allowing North Korean workers working in their countries. American allies like Poland are still allowing the North Korean workers working in their shipyards. So a lot, major, a lot of measures can be taken with the cooperation with American allies. Why? American government cannot ask Arab allies to do more. And uh, if I could interrupt at that point, we have passed sanctions legislation, which allows us to deploy sanctions against those uh, entities, and we should be doing that. It's a very good point. We well, need you, to go to Mr. Brad Schneider of Ambassador, Illinois. Ambassador, you're an inspiration. Brad Schneider of Illinois. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you for providing this opportunity for Mr. Tay to join us. It was an honor to be with uh, the chairman in Korea, in South Korea in August, and a chance to meet with you there. And I thank you for that time. I appreciate you coming here and, and sharing uh, your experiences, your, your insights. It's, it's very important that you're here, and your candor and frankness is very much appreciated. Uh, one of the things you mentioned is that as the elite within North Korea get promoted, it involves greater sacrifice and entails increasing risk. Given that, what would be the impact in North Korea of providing more opportunities for the elite to defect, and how might the uh, international community go to creating those opportunities for defection? Yes, I think we should have a tailor-made uh, strategy for uh, North Korean elites uh, to defect. Uh, the, for instance, uh, uh, before I defect to South Korea, I uh, 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 studied about the system of uh, South Korea. What can I do? What kind of life uh, in my future in South Korea? I searched all the contents in the internet, but 
As before my arrival to South Korea and spending few months in South Korea, I could not get any information what kind of treatments or what kind of you know, status I can be given by South Korean government. But of course, there are general the uh, the policy of equal treatment for North Korean defectors in South Korea. But as for high elite defectors, I think we should make a, a tailor-made a law uh, so that if we make the great the exit of North Korean uh, elites for defection, I think we should uh, upgrade more the current treatment, uh, the policies of North Korea's elite group, because the country like North Korea can be easily collapsed if the group of elites leave that system. Great, thank you. You, you also talked about, um, I liked how you described it, the uh, thumb drives that are now nose drives that uh, young people can, can hide. But uh, that's a, just a, a mechanism to get more information into the mass population of North Korea. I know others have touched on it a little bit, but could you expand a bit about some of the most important messages we need to communicate to the people of North Korea to try to unravel the brainwashing that's coming from the Kim regime and expose North Koreans to what is the reality within their country, but also the reality in South Korea and the rest of the world? I think oh, we can make uh, tailor-made contents comparing the reality in North Korea and South Korea because North and South, we share the same language, same culture, and also we have a huge separate families who have also bloodlines. That's why I think if we make a good tailor-made contents to educate North Korean people, something like we may use the ordinary daily life of North Korea. For instance, in North Korea, there is no concept of a proper payment for the labor they sacrificed. North Korea was in place for several decades without properly payment. For instance, when I worked as the Deputy General Director of North Korea's Foreign Ministry, my monthly salary was 2,900 North Korean won. At that time, one kilo of rice was 3,400 won. So with one month's salary, I cannot even afford to buy one kilo of rice. So North Korean system is that kind of is stupid, but people just take it as granted because they are used to this kind of stupidity for a long time, then nobody uh, thinks it's strange. So that's why we should educate North Korean people that everyone in North Korean system are entitled for proper payment. Is it, in your sense, in your, your experience, is this something that should be done in high production qualities, or is it more important that it's coming from people as you mentioned, there were the connections, fam familiar connections, North Koreans and South Koreans share those bonds. It's something that should be done showing every, just everyday life in, in South Korea. No, everyday life in North Korea, I mean. Right. No, yes. but, but showing to the North Koreans what it's like everyday life in South Korea, that there is opportunity that someone gets a fair day's wage for a, a fair day's work, that uh, there is opportunity to, to raise your family and give them be a better future than, than what uh, their parents are, are enduring right now. Yes, the, uh, something like that. For instance, I, uh, yesterday I told a very interesting story in CSIS about the cultural concepts in North Korea. In North Korea, for instance, when the girls uh, with a physical beauty reaches the age of 14, they are automatically and naturally registered by the regime. And when the girls reach the age of 16 and 17, and if they the girls keep that physical beauty, then they would be mobilized to be sent to the capital to be employed either in special hospitals or guest houses for the entertainment of Kim family. But in North Korea, if the young girl with physical beauty is sent to Pyongyang for that purpose, the villagers of, the fa of that, you see, uh, the village would regard it as a kind of honor of the family. It is really a sp stupid culture which was practiced and prevailed several hundreds of years ago in the Lee dynasty of Korea. But still, North Korea people believe that they, the Kim family can exploit sexually their daughters, you know, beautiful daughters. So it is really a stupid 
the system and culture. We should educate North Korean people how stupid they are by sending their beautiful daughters to the capital. Okay. Well, we, I we need I'm to out of time. Now, Thank you. Yep, we need to now go to Brian Mast, Florida. Major. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, sir, for your remarks today. Uh, you have spoken uh, a little bit about the history of, of nuclear development in North Korea. I believe you were speaking about the Joint Institute for Nuclear Research previously, that overlap between Russia and North Korea going back quite a long way. And we're all very familiar with the proliferation efforts of AQ Khan. I want to ask a little bit more modernly to your knowledge has there been any effort by China to share either nuclear technology or ballistic missile technology uh, with North Korea in modern history? Oh, uh, first of all, I do not have any uh, clear information on fact of this nuclear cooperation between North and South and uh, China, but it is a common fact that though all those uh, the the ferries which carry. All, all those the, uh, the trucks which carry the ICBMs are Chinese-made uh, truck. This is a very uh, the common thing, even though uh, uh, China uh, uh, claims that those trucks were exported to North Korea for timber industry, but it is a proven fact that North Korea is actually using all those China-made trucks for ICBM deployment. Uh, so, and another thing, uh, it is uh, true that in uh, 60s and 70s, the basic technology of North Korean submarine were imported from China, and hundreds of Chinese technicians helped North Korea to build the first class of submarines. I do want to get to submarines in a moment. That is part of, uh, you know, the whole idea of nuclear triad. Uh, before I ask that question, though, to your knowledge, has North Korea uh, had a desire to or actually engaged in sharing their advancements with Iran? Oh, in the past, oh, whenever North Korea test those uh, satellites, oh, Iranian uh, scientists were invited to the site, and it is the, the common fact that during the war between Iraq and Iran, North Korea supported the Iran side by supplying vast uh, the uh, military equipment, and after that, be, and di because of that, there was strong cooperation between Iran and North Korea on all military terms. But in terms of nuclear cooperation, I do not have any clear fact information of that in that regard. North Korea is not a member of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. It's known that they pulled out in 2003. In your opinion, would they share? their advancements in nuclear technology with Iran. Do you think that they would have a desire to do that? Absolutely, because North Korea is a country who wants to sell anything for the hard currency. It is proved for a couple of occasions that North Korea was engaged in illicit activities like uh, uh, counterfeiting currencies, drugs. So why not their nuclear technology? So you did bring up submarines, and there's uh, quite often the emphasis on conversation is placed on ICBM technology. I would like to know, from your knowledge, uh, has there been an effort to advance capabilities that would allow delivery of a nuclear weapon from a submarine system where they could get off the coast of Japan or South Korea or, or the United States or any other area of the coast? Has there been a desire or an effort to advance in their submarine de uh, delivery capabilities? Oh, it was uh, reported a couple of times, and North Korea also claimed that it made uh, dramatic uh, improvements in their submarine uh, the delivery, especially by, uh, in terms of cold launching uh, the technology. And last year, uh, North Korea proved a couple of times that it made great advancements in uh, SLMB, the test. And I'm sure that North Korea will continue on that process. I have uh, one final question as it pertains to, I guess the best way I could put it would be safety. You know, historically speaking, in the, in the world of, of nuclear weapons between the United States of America and Russia, there have been very known protocols. At one point, it was mutually assured destruction, and then there was a ladder of escalation that everybody knew what the various steps of that were, you know, selective ambiguity. And so what I would like to know is, has North Korea, in an effort to obtain a nuclear weapon, 
Have they also made an effort to secure any of the safety protocols that have existed with the United States of America or Russia to ensure that there is not an accidental launch of a weapon or that somebody that uh, is not part of the regime in control could get in, in control or, or in control of a nuclear football, as we call it here, and, and make a launch? Has there any, been any safety efforts? Oh, oh. Last year, uh, North Korea uh, announced that the, uh, the North Korean Army Strategic Military Unit, which means the ICBM missile unit, uh, uh, directly belongs to Kim Jong-un himself. They officially announced it. So this means that Kim Jong-un wants to delegate the direct instructions from his command to directly to the general who is in charge of that whole uh, missile unit. And, uh, I haven't read or seen any that kind of uh, safety uh, the regulations, how to control or uh, the manage the North Korea's nuclear arsenal. Uh, uh, in personally, I haven't heard any that kind of uh, uh, the regulations or procedures. We need to go to Colonel Ted Liu of California. Uh, thank you, sir, for your courage and for testifying before the United States Congress. And thank you, Chairman Royce, for holding this important hearing and giving us the opportunity to ask questions. Uh, you, sir, had mentioned elites in your testimony. You said you were one of the elites. How many people are we talking about uh, in that category, would you say? Oh, you mean uh, in uh, the total elites or only just diplomats? The, the number, total elites in North Korea. Oh. It's ballpark figure. Oh, you know, uh, it's really uh, difficult to uh, give an exact percentage of the uh, the elite group. But according to the recent survey, the North Korean society is a class society. Uh, while uh, there are uh, three classes, the main ruling class is called uh, core class, and uh, next is a wavering class, and the last one is hostile class. And uh, according to the uh, academic search by calculating the population of Pyongyang, the capital of North Korea, uh, the experts is, uh, are arguing maybe 25% of North Korean population are belong to core class. And usually elite uh, are chosen only from core class. So uh, to my impression, when we say about elite, I think uh, maybe uh, Less than 10,000 to my Okay, and, and you as an elite clearly saw the truth, um, which is why you, you defected. Is your sense that most of the elites also see the truth, or do you think most of them are brainwashed and, and don't really know what's going on? Oh, North Korea is a very strange and unique system. For instance, if you are in high uh, the, the rank, that does not mean that you have more access to information. For instance, inside North Korea, the most powerful institution which controls every sector of life is uh, guidance and organization of department of Central Committee of Workers' Party of Korea. There are around three or 400 people actually who controls the whole North Korea. But do these people have access to outside information like me? No, because there are only 10,000 diplomats, uh, uh, there are only 1,000 diplomats working in foreign ministry who have that kind of access to world news, for instance, or those, uh, the world newspapers or, or, or these foreign magazines. But the people who are working much higher in rank do not have any uh, ability to access this kind of outside information. So uh, even though you are in high rank, that does not mean that you have the access and, of and information. And if, if we could deliver information to the elites, do you think that would be enough? Or do you think we actually have to do what you said, just give a lot of information to the people? I think oh, the, we should uh, make a different contents uh, which can be targeted uh, for the, the different, you know, the people and class of North Korea. For instance, the, there is no any a sense of solidarity between the core class and uh, wavering or hostile. There is a kind of, you know, uh, hidden hatredism 
uh, between uh, core class and hostile class because during the Korean War and before the Korean War, actually their ancestors fought each other. So that's why uh, now the ruling class or elite in North Korean society uh, are afraid of uh, any kind of uh, political revenge if there is any change of the system or if there is any sudden contingency in North Korean the society. So we should continue to deliver a kind of message that if uh, they cooperate with the rest of the population to change the North Korean regime, then their future would be guaranteed. They can, for instance, America, uh, together with South Korea, can control and prevent any political revenge, any fiscal revenge from the, those victims uh, of Kim Jong Un, you know, those the persecution. So we should try to uh, make a kind of accommodation uh, of feelings and uh, the those you know the, the hatredisms between elite class and wavering and hostile class. So that is the best way to uh, make a change. Thank you. I appreciate it. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Liu. We go now to Mr. Ted Yoho of Florida. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ambassador Tay. Good seeing you again. Um, <clears throat> as you can see, this is on TV. It's being broadcast here. If it's being broadcast here with the astuteness of the uh, North Koreans being able to hack in, we can probably assume that if Kim Jong-un and his people wanted to watch are watching this right now. So I'm going to direct this probably more to them. <laughs> and. Um, you know, it was brought up that he's getting his ICBMs and his military weapons to protect his regime and uh, preserve himself. And I would think that if any other country wanted to topple him, they would have done it by now. So I don't think that's really an issue. I think um, what we really need to focus on is bringing him to the table and, and have a diplomatic end to this nonsense, you know, building nuclear wars in the 21st century. And I wanted to ask you, without uh, having North Korea on the state sponsor of terrorism list, do you think that makes the, the uh, sanctions less effective versus putting North Korea back on the state sponsor of terrorism list? What's your thoughts? I think uh, we should avail every the possible uh, non-military options to stop North Korea's continuation of and, this In your opinion, if we put North Korea, being a diplomat from North Korea, if we were to put North Korea back on the state sponsor of terrorism list, do you think that would have uh, more effect by other countries that you visited? Absolutely. Okay. Let me ask you this. What kind of relationship does North Korea have on a diplomatic level with other countries? What did they focus on? When you're in a country, when you're a North, uh, North Korean diplomat and you're in the countries that you were in, was it a, a, a feeling of respect you got from another country or was it a feeling of uh, tolerance that they put up with North Korea? Oh, for instance, as a diplomat working in United Kingdom, I was always instructed to use the British government's uh, North Korean policy of critical engagement. And oh, I always tried my best to convince the British government to let them use their role to prevent any uh, possible war uh, scenario on Korean Peninsula. For instance, if there is a, a key resolve war exercise of the British military uh, representative or a small personnel were always invited to take part in that war exercise. And it is my job to visit the British Foreign Office and the Defense Ministry to convince them not to go to joint military exercise. Okay, so you focus more on military, whereas my experience has been with most um, embassies from country to country, they focus on trade, uh, economies, building economies, and cultural exchanges. You're, you're saying you just focused on military and don't attack us. Of course, you know, for instance, there is a, almost no any trade relations between uh, North Korea and Britain. That's why there is no point for me to build this, that kind of things. But as for cultural exchanges, uh, uh, British side uh, tried to invite as many as North Korean uh, civil servants to take part in English short-term training course. And I thought that it will be helpful for North Korean elites to look around the 
democracy and freedom in UK. All right, but you didn't see many embassies sending people to North Korea, did you? Oh, other some embassies. Countries, some countries and some countries don't. All right, I just want to do a brief review of history, and again, this is directed at the people of North Korea that may be listening to this. Um, you know, we had a war with Germany and Japan. Um, we had a war with South Korea and Vietnam. A lot of people died, a lot of buildings got destroyed. But there's a common denominator, and that common denominator is war. But the other common denominator is trade. You know, so we fought these wars, and at the end, we're all big trading partners. South Korea, South Korea has a market economy. They're our sixth largest trading partner. Vietnam is a communist country that engaged in market economies. They're our 16th largest trading partner. Germany and Japan are huge trading partners. And so what I would encourage the Kim Jong-un regime is don't go to war. If we're going to trade, let's just start trading now and do whatever we can to come to the negotiating table. Um, and that's what I would encourage them to do. And the, the illicit activities they do in their embassies from wildlife trafficking and uh, endangered species, you know, bring that to an end and let's just work on the, on the trade. Thank you for your time and I'll see you at lunch. Thank you. We go now to Joaquin Castro of Texas. Uh, thank you, Ambassador, for your testimony today and for your courage to defect. Uh, before I ask you a question, I just want to make a quick statement for the historical record because some have suggested that perhaps we should have taken or suggested, intimated that perhaps we should have taken military action before to stop new North Korea's nuclear program. But the, the problem with that is that post 9-11, once we were knee deep in two wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, the idea that the United States in 2006 or 2008 or 2009 was going to jump into another war in Asia, I think, seems very strange and unrealistic. Um, there's also been conflicting reports about North Korea's nuclear capabilities. So let me ask you very directly, what is your understanding of their ability to, del to deliver a nuclear weapon to, say, Japan or South Korea, mm. or beyond that? Oh. North Korea has started its nuclear development from late of 1950s, so that means that North Korea uh, spent several decades on completing this nuclear program. So I think it is a, uh, we should admit that North Korea has reached uh, this certain level of nuclear development, and actually they are at the doorstep before final completion. Do you think they can deliver a nuclear weapon to South Korea? Oh, uh, I'm not quite sure whether they will definitely deliver or not, but if we see the current North Korean brainwashing education system, they are educating the North Korean military officers that they should blindly follow what Kim Jong-un instructs. Well, I guess let me ask you this, Ambassador. Are you certain that they can't deliver a nuclear weapon to South Korea? I I think if Kim Jong-un believes that his life is threatened, I think he can do anything, as long as he has something. Okay. What's your understanding of North Korea's uh, abilities within cyberspace, their ability to attack on a cyber level the way the Russians have interfered with our elections, for example, and the way that North Korea purportedly interfered with Sony's systems and did a big data dump? Uh, what's your assessment of the, the cyber capabilities? I do not have the exact information about the cyber attacking, you know, the network of North Korea, but what I have seen during my life in North Korea, that North Korea has a very good educational system to educate those cyber professionals. So people are being trained in That's cyber right, very from, actively. from middle school ages. So North Korea has a very good educational system to do that. Okay. Um, and in addition to China, which other world economies, which other nations are propping up the North Korean economy? Uh, I know China makes up a, the lion's share of it, but in your experience, based on what you saw, what other countries are out there that are helping prop up this economy? I think the first China and the naturally Russia is the second, and Southeast Asian countries like uh, Vietnam, Malaysia, and Thailand, these, the geof Graphically nearest countries are the number third trading partners of North Korea. And with what kind of activities, what kind of goods or what kind of things are being traded, what, what kind of activity makes up? Oh, North Korea are 
exporting most of its raw materials like coal, uh, the iron ore, seafood, of these things to uh, China, and in return, uh, North Korea buying the highly uh, uh, technologies and modern goods from the China. So I think North Korea's foreign trade is mostly dependent on China. And then one last question for you. It's been many decades now since North and South Korea have basically been two separate distinct nations. Supposing that the North Korean government and society did crumble, do you believe that North Korea and South Korea, being apart now for so long, could realistically reunify? Yes, I think so, because you know we share the same language and same blood and same culture. North and South uh, has been divided only for 70 years, but what I learned after my arrival to uh, South Korea, I learned we have so many things in common. There is no problem for me to understand Chinese culture or system or language. Uh, so I think uh, it will be a very easy process to accommodate uh, the North and South Korea if these two Koreas are reunified. Thank you. And then just to bookend my comment from the beginning, I think that this debate over whether we, take, we should have taken military action in North Korea earlier, perhaps a decade ago, um, really underlines the mistake of the Iraq War. We went into the Iraq War believing that Saddam Hussein was developing nuclear capabilities that North Korea was actually developing, but we took no action there. Uh, without making a judgment about whether we shouldn't, should or should not have taken military action, I think the mistake of Iraq is um, made worse by that realization. Thank you for your testimony today, Ambassador. Thank you for questioning. Thank you. We go now to uh, Andriano uh, Espelot from New York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Ambassador, for your insightful testimony. Uh, for many years, we heard of uh, the hunger and famine uh, impacting the North Korean people. Uh, what's the status of the hunger, and, and, and is there any famine? Uh, often when our, our peoples uh, are facing those kinds of very adverse conditions, there is a, an instinct to dissent and to rebel. Is there, what's the status of the food situation in, in North Korea right now? Before 1990s, North Korea maintained very effective ration system. At that time, everyone in North Korea enjoyed a certain rations of the food every month. But these days, this ration system is only available for uh, the, the civil servants, uh, like uh, working in the ministries or army, armies or security forces. And if we see the effect of this malnutrition and famine in North Korea for the past uh, 20 and 30 years, now if we compare the general height of North Korean uh, young children and South Korean young generation, there is, is even one 10 centimeters uh, gap between South Korean young generation and North Korean young generation. So because of this long decade of malnutrition, even the physical toll of uh, North Koreans are changing. So I think this is a clearly proves that this kind of, you know, the uh, malnutrition and fam famine are still severely going on in North Korea. You mentioned about uh, your testimony about North Korea's forced labor and China benefits. Uh, which are the other countries that benefit from forced labor? And are there any particular areas or products that they are producing that we can uh, identify and potentially boycott? For instance, the, the North Korean workers are the main the source of labor in Russia for their timber industry. In Russian a society nowadays, no Russian uh, wanted to work in that cold weather conditions in Siberia. It is North Korean workers, actually, who help Russian's timber industry. And for the construction industry, the main the source of labor are from North Korea. And if we see the Middle East, the countries like Kuwait or Arab Emirates of these countries, there are more than uh, 50,000 North Korean workers are working in those countries, especially in construction building. And if you uh, 
see the countries in Africa like uh, the Angola or Uganda. Uh, now there are many North Korean uh, medical teams working in very uh, bad, severe conditions of uh, rural hospitals is to earn the hard currency in those countries. Okay. Uh, in what are, be, beyond the Chinese and the Russian sphere of influence, uh, are there any relationships between the North Korean government and countries in the Western Hemisphere? Yes, of course. You see, North Korea uh, has diplomatic relations and with almost all European countries except France and Estonia. And North Korea has 11 embassies in Europe. That's why uh, this proves that North Korea still has vast network of diplomatic service in uh, European countries. What about in, in Latin America and the Caribbean? In Latin America, to my knowledge, now there are embassies in five countries like Cuba, Venezuela, Mexico, Peru, uh, and so on. Uh, that, to my knowledge, yes. Okay, finally, uh, you mentioned that, that there are thousands of defectors in China and in South Korea, and that the need to protect them is paramount. And if they're sent back to North Korea, they will be tortured or forced, uh, submitted to forced labor. What kind of pressure you think should be exerted against China to prevent this from happening, but also to protect uh, defectors there in, in, in the mainland of China? Before I uh, uh, traveled to America, I happened to visit a one a school in Seoul where they kept the children are born by this uh, uh, sex exploitation in China. The children in school in Seoul, where I visited, the children even do not speak Korean languages. They only speak Chinese. They are the children born between the ladies who uh, uh, worked as sex slaves in China and with Chinese husbands. So when these, the poor uh, North Korean uh, ladies arrived in uh, South Korea and they uh, brought back all those, the, the children they had with their uh, Chinese husbands. But the, the status of the children are very poor because they, the, the, these children were not registered while they are in what, China. What kind of pressure is I'm, I'm going to have to interrupt at this point. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We, we have um, very, few men, very little time left. I'm going to ask if uh, Mr. Garrett and if uh, Mr. David Cicilline would join me at lunch uh, immediately after a lunch which we're supposed to be doing right now uh, with, <laughs> with our witness. Um, we, are, we are far past out of time, and uh, we've been asked several times to wrap this up. But we've had one person waiting in the queue for a while uh, who has a problem with his knee, and that's Mr. Jerry Connolly. Uh, from Virginia. Uh, Jerry, would you like to ask your questions, and then the rest of us are going to go to lunch with this guest. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'll try to be succinct. Mr. Tay, you indicated that essentially uh, Kim Jong-un and his regime are going to pursue nuclear-tipped ICBMs at all costs because they see it as the key to the preservation of the regime. Is there anything the Western alliance, the United States, with working with Japan and Korea, and maybe even South Korea and even China, or whoever, do we possess something he wants so much that he would stop the nuclear development and possibly even roll it back the way we did with Iran? I don't think so. So we're way past the point of no return. That we should continue the current the momentum of sanctions and campaign of diplomatic isolation. I think that is the only way to force North Korea give up its nuclear ambition. Sanctions don't have the appreciable effect because of the black market economy, both through China and Russia, that you were describing, as well as some other business relationships North Korea has been able to establish. Is that your view? Oh, uh, but you know, only sanctions uh, is not effective to stop this process. But if we uh, build up our pressure on China to stop the smugglings, and also if we continue and expand our activity of 
disseminating information to educate North Korean people in the long run, I'm absolutely sure that North Korean people one day would stand up to change the course. Do you, a final question, do you believe Kim Jong-un and his regime understand that the use of nuclear weapons would almost certainly bring enormous retaliation in kind, destroying the regime he seeks purportedly to perpetuate? I think Kim Jong-un is uh, aware of that, but on the meanwhile, he also believes that if he has these nuclear weapons, he can successfully compel Washington to pull its troops out from Korean Peninsula. Thank you. I'm going to yield back my time. I thank the chairman for his graciousness. Thank you, Mr. Tay, for your courage and thank bravery you. in being here today. Thank, thank you. you, Mr. Connolly. And uh, Mr. Tay, I, I want to thank you for sharing your story and your insights with the committee here, and also thank the National Endowment for Democracy, which has supported your trip. Uh, as the ranking member mentioned, as Elliot Engel said, we have had many hearings with experts on North Korea. No one has brought the insights that you have brought today, and your testimony will be of great and lasting value, I believe, to the committee. One area I wanted to underscore is the abysmal human rights situation of the North Korean people. We know how badly North Koreans are abused. Hundreds of thousands are in gulags. The Kim regime's aggression against uh, us reflects their aggression against North Koreans. And I think one message we have heard again and again is the importance of communicating with the North Korean people, letting them know of the true, true nature of the brutal and very corrupt regime there. And I think the Korean people deserve so much better than the government that they have. And to that end, we need to do a much better, better job with our international broadcasting efforts and other efforts. I think our national security depends on it. And Mr. Tay, we appreciate your courage again in appearing before us. You have presented outstanding testimony that will help all Korean people and the cause of peace. You should be proud. And the hearing stands adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.